Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Emiliano, for, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here, uh, I guess, virtually today. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that the work that I'm going to present today uh, is work that I did in collaboration with many other people. Um, so I try to put the title of the papers that I'm uh, discussing at the bottom of my slides so that you can reverse engineer uh, who is contributing to the different uh, projects. And so I want to acknowledge the contributions of everyone. So what do I mean by trustworthy machinery? I think it's important to start by laying out sort of the concepts that, that we care about and that I'm going to discuss in, in the presentation today. So the first aspect is, is of course, the security of, of machinery and systems, where we've seen examples in the last couple of years of attacks against sort of real world systems for all of the three sort of axes of the traditional security triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So back, I think in 2016, uh, Florian Tramel and, and his collaborators demonstrated that you can interact with a machine learning model that's uh, deployed through an API and, and as a result of this interaction, steal a copy of the machine learning model. So that shows that the, the confidentiality of the model itself is, a, is at stake. Um, in, in another example, uh, adversaries have also targeted the integrity of machine learning systems. Um, the example that I like to give is this paid chatbot that was released a couple of years back uh, by Microsoft, and which was basically a language model designed to interact with people on Twitter. And uh, what uh, some malicious users figured out is they can use this interaction through Twitter with, with the chatbot uh, to basically pollute its training set and to, and to perform a poisoning attack. And so what happened within a couple of hours of the, the language model starting to produce tweets uh, by, by predicting is that it started produ uh, producing tweets uh, that contain offensive language that the malicious users had sort of conditioned it uh, to produce. And so here you have an example of a tweet that, that I put in, in, in the middle of the slide. And uh, just, just for context, this is one of the few tweets that I was comfortable adding on the slides. There are much worse ones uh, that were demonstrated. And then recently, um, one, one of my visiting students, Ilya Shumailov, uh, demonstrated another axis of this triad, which is the, the availability. And what, what he found is that you can uh, target the availability of machine learning at inference, where you can craft inputs that are specifically designed to increase the energy and the latency uh, of a machine learning's prediction. And so in particular, what he found is uh, that is one of Azure's uh, translation system, uh, he could craft inputs that would multiply the inference time by a factor of 6,000, uh, which is of course very large. Uh, and then you can imagine that the, the consumption of the data center's energy uh, can be sort of, uh, uh, sort of increased uh, to a point where you might have a denial of service or if you're looking at models that are deployed on uh, edge devices, the, the battery consumption might be uh, a limitation in terms of uh, the availability of the device itself. So I'm not sure who is drawing on my slides, but I didn't know this was possible on Zoom. Uh, so please please don't draw too much on the slides so I can still present the, the talk. Uh, this, is, this is very funny. Um, so this, the, the second axis of trustworthy machine learning that I wanted to discuss briefly, and I won't cover this today, is safety. So here we're looking at security, as, uh, but this time without an adversary in the picture, where just a brief example, uh, people have found, for instance, that machine learning using autonomous driving uh, is, sub is subject to very subtle changes in the lighting uh, of the input. So for instance, here in the the system was predicting that the, the car should continue along the road. Whereas here to the right, the image is a little bit darker and you can see that now it's making the wrong prediction. So even if there is no adversary in, in the picture, it is very uh, important to think about the worst case uh, behavior of our machine learning systems. And that's what uh, I'm going to discuss a lot today in the first part of the talk. Another component of the sort of the trust that we have in machine learning uh, is around privacy. So in, in privacy here, what, what is going on is we're training our models on sensitive data 
And we don't want uh, the uh, model that we deployed to reveal some of the attributes of the sensitive data. Of course, the prime example for this is healthcare data. Um, and what we've been working on in my group uh, was that uh, is, is called membership inference attacks, where essentially what we're trying to tell is whether a particular point was used to train the model or not. And so this was introduced uh, a couple of years ago by Reza Shokri and his collaborators. And what we found recently is that we can perform these attacks simply by observing the labels predicted by the model. So I'll come back to that later uh, in the talk. And Ali, no, no problem. Uh, Ali is saying that his uh, daughter is drawing on the slide. So I'm, I'm very happy that my talk is engaging uh, everyone here in the audience, no, no worries. And then um, the last aspect that I'll discuss in the conclusion of the talk is fairness and ethics. So we've seen a lot of coverage recently around the limitations of facial recognition due to both the data that we're collecting, but also the algorithms that uh, we're using. And uh, in particular, what I'll discuss is, is a slightly different problem, which is the problems of deep fakes and the uh, sort of the, the example that it shows as to why we should uh, care about the ethical implications of the work that we're doing in machine. So that's just to set this, the setting uh, of the different topics that I'll be covering today. And what I'm going to do in the first part of the talk is uh, do a deep dive on two topics. So the first one will be robustness to adversarial examples. And the second one will be work on making machine learning more private. So these are sort of the two uh, topics. And what I'm going to show you is how we've approached uh, these two problems in a very different way. And as a result, the outcome for these two research areas is very different. And so I'm going to contrast this and then as a result, draw lessons for what I think we should be doing uh, to, to continue our research on making machine learning more trustworthy. So let me start with a primer on adversarial examples. Um, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of you in the room are already familiar with this, um, but I'll just quickly remind sort of the basics of how this works. The idea here is that we want to find inputs that are misclassified uh, by a machine learning uh, model. Here, we'll take an example of a neural network, uh, which is classifying handwritten digits. Uh, this is a very simple task, but it's, it's nice in the sense that it makes it easy to understand what is going on. So we have this image of a one here, which is correctly classified by our neural network. And as an adversary, we want to force the neural network to produce the prediction four on this image of a one. And so, the first step that we're going to, to be looking at is, is the uh, sensitivity, sensitivity estimation, where the idea is we're going to take the neural network's architecture and we're going to compute its Jacobian in this particular input. So that means we have derivatives of all of the um, output scores with respect to all of the input features. And so this tells us if I modify one of the input features, how is this going to impact the score that the model is predicting for the different classes? And we use this, this information to build a saliency map, uh, which is going to reflect how each feature is likely to contribute to the uh, goal of the adversary. So what happens here is that you have a visualization of the saliency map where the saliency score is on the vertical axis and the, the horizontal axis correspond to the layout of the pixels in the original image. So what you can see is that there is a handful of pixels here uh, that have very high saliency, which means they will contribute to the adversary's goal of changing the prediction from a one to a four. How do we compute the saliency score? Well, basically, we're going to look at the Jacobian matrix components, and we're going to look for features that have very high positive derivatives for the target class that the adversary chose, which is four in this case, and close to zero or negative uh, derivatives with respect to the other classes, which means the model's prediction will not only increase for four, but it will also decrease or stay constant for the other class. And then we uh, greedily select some of these pixels to be perturbed, look at the outcome in the model's prediction, and if we haven't achieved what we want, we simply iterate back with the modified image, refresh the Jacobian matrix uh, values, and then update the CNC map and pick more features to perturb. So 
What was uh, sort of very surprising at that time when, when we did this work back in 2015, 2016, is that we could control the model's prediction for any input from any source class uh, to any target class of our choice. So what you can see here is, as a result, a confusion matrix where all of the images on the diagonal are correctly classified. And uh, all of the off diagonal images are, are misclassified in a class we chose, which is indicated at the top of each column. And so here, if you look at the first row, this is the image of a zero classified as a one, two, three, four. So of course, this has in implications to security because you have no uh, principled way of uh, reasoning about the integrity of your model if an adversary can take an input of their choice and force your model to predict an output of their choice. Two reminders that I like to give about adversarial examples is that despite the fact that most of the work has been done on image data sets and with uh, deep learning uh, algorithms, uh, you can find similar inputs and in using the same exact algorithms or variants of these algorithms for things like logistic regression, decision trees, SVMs, nearest neighbors. And of course, you can use these algorithms beyond images. So a couple of examples that we've looked at in the past is malware detection, where if you use them, uh, what we did in particular is uh, Android malware detection problem, where you can modify a subset of the features from the manifest of the Android application, which means that it's easier to perturb it because you only have to change the XML file. You don't need to change the code itself. Uh, and that's sufficient to evade detection. We also looked at reinforcement learning where you can perturb the environment of uh, a video game, for instance, and uh, a neural network that had originally learned the correct policy to navigate this video game is now forced to sort of lose the, the, the game. The, the second thing that I wanted to uh, remind, and here I'm, I'm slowly building up upon what I actually want to discuss today. Um, the second thing that I wanted to, to remind you about adversarial examples is that it's uh, somewhat easy to find them in, even if you don't have white box access to the model. So the algorithm I discussed here requires white box access and there is a, a lot of variants of, of this attack that uh, have been explored uh, based on this gradient based search where you need to have white box access to the model of course to compute these gradients. What happens is that uh, we realize we, you can come up with an attack that is fully black box uh, if, you, if you split your attack in two steps. First, you have a reconnaissance step where you extract a copy of the model, and then you use that copy of the model in the second step to actually mount the attack because you now have white box access to the copy of that model to find adversarial examples. So this allows me to make a small di diversion on model extraction, uh, which is a topic that a lot of um, my collaborators and students have been working on recently. So I wanted to give you an overview of, of uh, what, what kind of results we've been able to achieve. Um, and so initially sort of uh, model extraction started on, on sort of simpler models like logistic regression or decision trees. And now we're able to extract very large uh, neural networks uh, with very high degrees of fidelity with, with the original model. And so the main intuition to take away from this line of work is that any form of progress in machine learning, uh, in the machine learning community that is made towards learning with little or no supervision is going to make model extraction a lot easier. And so I, I gave some examples here on this slide. So just, just to walk you through one, for instance, the ML community has made tremendous progress in the last two, two years or so in learning uh, in a semi-supervised way where only part of your data is labeled. And so what this means as an adversary is you can use these algorithms to make less queries to the model you're trying to steal. And despite that, still have a, a stolen copy of the model that is still fairly accurate. And so this is something that we explored in this work on, uh, on mix match, uh, which is uh, an approach to semi-supervised learning. Uh, another example is this work here on uh, language models. Uh, where Kalpesh here found that if you're looking at extracting language models, because everyone, or I, I should say most people today are training language models by fine tuning from uh, very large uh, existing language models. So you can look at work on BERT, for instance, as a good example. 
What this means is the adversary has a lot of implicit knowledge. They know that if you've trained a, a language model, it's very likely that it's itself fine-tuned from these original models. So as an adversary, you can use one of these large language models uh, to bootstrap your extraction process. And so what's surprising there is that Kalpish was able to find that you can use random queries to extract the model. Whereas on images, for instance, we always had to get a sense of what is a natural image looking like uh, before we make uh, the, the model extraction query. So this is uh, in some sense concerning uh, given the increased homogeneity uh, in, in the approaches that people are taking in, in the language domain. Um, another uh, sort of result that I found uh, very intriguing in terms of model extraction is uh, you have to observe that model extraction is impossible to prevent uh, for the simple reason that if the adversary is able to observe the output of the model for any input of their choice, it makes very sense. It's very intuitive. If you think about it, you have a, a, a mathematical function. You can look at the output of that function for any input of your choice. Of course, after a certain number of queries, uh, you can recover an approximation of this function that is fairly good. And so uh, one way to think about this is that, well, if we can't prevent model extraction, can we actually detect when someone has stolen our model? And so this is something that we've been looking at uh, and, and we'll be presenting uh, our results at ICLR later this year. Um, so so the, the students here, Pratyush and Mohammed, what they found is that they can use techniques inspired uh, by the membership inference literature, which is work on privacy, uh, to tell whether someone has stolen uh, a copy of our model. And so the way that it works is that as a defender, if you have trained a model, you of course have training data for this model. And so what you can do is you can go and query models that you suspect have uh, stolen your model. And you can look at these models behavior on your training set. And so if these models behave on your training set in a way that in indicates that they were trained on, on this uh, training data that you possess, then you can infer that they were stolen uh, from that they're a copy of your model. And so this is very interesting because membership inference usually is difficult because you're trying to tell whether a particular point was a member of your uh, training set or not. But here, since you're the defender, you have the entire training set at your disposition. So you can actually query multiple times with different training points and get a fairly high degree of confidence that the, a particular model was stolen. So this is a very uh, interesting and, and fun result. Back to adversarial examples, uh, the whole purpose of what I was saying until now is that we have very good techniques to extract models. And so now we can use the copy of the model to uh, craft adversarial examples, even if the original model was a black box. So why was I talking about this uh, for the last sort of 15 minutes? The reason is that now we're in a, a situation where we have a lot of results on adversarial examples that show that it's sort of a credible threat where uh, whether you have white box or black box success. And so, of course, the community has been working uh, on defending against adversarial examples. And uh, the, the, the main strategy that people have explored is to prove that the model is more constant around its training data than an undefended model. The, the reason is that if you think about adversarial examples, they show that the models are too sensitive to small perturbations of their inputs. And so the, if you visualize things here, I have my ideal decision boundary, which is the black line here. And the red dotted line is the model that I'm training. And so my image here of a, of a three, which is a training image, is too close from the, the decision boundary and the decision boundary is not exact. So there is a, a region here where I can perturb this image into, uh, which will produce adversarial examples. So what is the approach that we've uh, tried to take both empirically and through uh, methods that can be verified, we, we want to prove that the model can be constant around its training data. Basically, we're going to use some distance metric and say, well, I want my model to make the same prediction all around the training data within uh, a certain distance. So you're basically defining, uh, for instance, an LP ball if you're using a P norm. And so, a lot of research has been done uh, by other groups on, on this. And uh, essentially what, what they have been able to do is to show that you can train classifiers 
that are constant around their training data. So now you get this dotted black line here, and you can see that around my training image, these inputs here within the LP bowl are on the same side of this black, this uh, dotted black line. So they're all going to be classified the same way. So have we solved adversarial examples? Unfortunately, no. So this is sort of the pessimistic part of the talk where what you can observe here is that now we've made the model too insensitive to changes uh, to its inputs. And so you can find images like this image of a five here, which is semantically very different from the image of a three, of course, because it's a different digit. But in the P norm, it's very close from the image of a three. You can see here that there are very few pixels that change. And so what this means is that the model that we've trained to be robust to adversarial examples is going to classify this image as a three because it's very similar to the image here, the training image of a three. Whereas if I look at my undefended model initially, it would have correctly classified this image as a five because the image is on the other side of the red dotted line. And so what you can see here is because the, the definition that we're using for robustness is uh, not uh, aligned with the uh, generalization goal that we're trying to prove here, it's not aligned with the perception uh, of the different uh, classes, we won't be able to defend against adversarial examples in the long run using these approaches uh, because we're essentially defending against one form of attacks that are exploiting the, uh, sensi the, the extra sensitivity and then introducing a new form of attacks that are uh, exploiting the lack of uh, sensitivity. And so in some sense, what the, this line of work is not going anywhere uh, because if, if you wanted to use P norms to provide robustness to adversarial examples, you would have to define a radius for each of the training images. So rather than prove a single radius for the entire data set, you would have to have multiple radii for each of the training uh, points. And so unfortunately, this means that sort of, uh, this is something we illustrated in this paper. And this means that sort of, we, we won't be able to get robustness to adversarial examples using uh, these lines of work, even if the, the results are, are verifiable. So this is the pessimistic conclusion here. Um, and so uh, taking a step back, does that mean that we're sort of locked into this arms race as, as is the case for a lot of computer systems where just like real world security, we have to balance the cost of protection with the risk of loss, right? If you have a home, uh, you're going to uh, put a lock on your door. It will prevent most burglars from entering your home, but it's not gonna prevent a black bear from entering your home. And, and the question here that I'm asking is, is machine learning uh, introducing a paradigm that is sufficiently different for us to be able to reason about trustworthy machine learning in a principal way so that we can avoid this arms race, right? And so if you look at the first part of the presentation, of course, the, the conclusion seems to be no, uh, but I'm going to switch gears and talk about privacy. And this will illustrate why I actually think that machine learning systems do bring a sufficiently different paradigm uh, in su such that we can actually reason uh, in a principled way about, about their uh, trustworthiness. And a, a good reason for this is that a lot of machine learning systems uh, sort of have similarities with how we reason about cryptography. Um, and a very good example of this is work on, on differential privacy. So differential privacy is very interesting because privacy, if I asked everyone, so usually I say in the room, but I guess here in the Zoom audience, um, if we ask each of us to write down what we think privacy means, we'll probably get very different answers. Um, and differential privacy is, is now established as sort of the, the framework to reason about privacy. And so I find that itself very surprising that we as a community could agree on, on, on a definition. So I think it's, it's worth noting. Um, and so the idea is that you have an adversary that is observing your output of uh, your algorithm and what you want your algorithm to do in order to be private is to produce outputs such that the adversary is unable to tell whether you're operating on one data set here, which contains the record corresponding to an individual, or whether your algorithm is operating on this second data set here, which is exactly the same data set without the re record for that specific individual. And so what this means is the adversary by looking at the outputs of your algorithm is unable to tell whether that specific individual even existed or not. 
And so by definition, they cannot learn anything private from, uh, from that individual. And so the nice thing about differential privacy is you have a way to formalize this uh, where you say that the probability of the algorithm uh, where, when it's operating on D here, which would be the first data set, uh, the probability of the algorithm making a certain output S has to be very close from the probability that the same algorithm here uh, operating this time on D prime, which is the second data set. So the algorithm has to make the probability that the algorithm makes the same output. And so if these two probabilities are very close and how close they are um, is characterized here by the parameter epsilon here, the smaller the epsilon value is, the closer these two probabilities are. And so intuitively, the closer these two probabilities are, the more indistinguishable these two scenarios are. And so the more private your algorithm is. So smaller values of epsilon are better. How do we obtain privacy in machine learning? So there are multiple approaches to do that. Some of my colleagues worked on an approach called differentially private stochastic gradient descent. Here, I'm going to uh, introduce Pate. Uh, which uh, it's an approach that I worked on, but that's not the reason that I want to, to discuss it. The reason is that it makes it very intuitive to see why differential privacy is an interesting uh, definition in the context of machine learning. And so the name Pate, even though I'm French, uh, is not a name that I came up with. Um, it stands for private aggregation of teacher ensembles. And the idea is to take your private data set and to partition it in n subsets of data. And so these are mathematical partitions in the sense that there is no overlap between the partitions. One data point here is in one of the partitions. From each of these partitions, you're going to train a single teacher model. And so each partition leads to one machine learning model. You don't need to do anything fancy about the way you train this model. You can use your existing algorithms, any algorithm, even the different teachers could be trained using different algorithms. The question now is how do I make this ensemble of teachers uh, predict with privacy? So what, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to ask all of these teachers to vote for the class that they'd like to predict when I present them with an input. And I'm going to build a histogram of votes uh, indicating how many teachers voted for each of the classes of my prom. And if I reveal the argmax of this histogram, the number of uh, the class that received the largest number of votes, then you can see how this provides privacy because in some sense, the more the teachers agree on a prediction, the less likely it is that this prediction was influenced by one of the partitions here because it was made multiple times independently. And so the less likely it is that it depends on a specific data point. And there is one catch here is that there are some edge cases where one teacher changing their prediction can change the outcome of the arg aggregation, the, the noisy argmax. Uh, and the reason is that if, if we have two, uh, two classes that receive about the same number of votes, then one teacher changing their prediction can change the, the, the class that received the most number of votes. So it can flip the order. And so, as I just said, the, reason, the, the way that we can uh, address this is by injecting noise into the histogram before we take the noisy argmax. And so this makes it impossible for the adversary to know whether the change is due to the noise uh, or to a change in the, in the teacher's prediction. And so when we release the noisy argmax, then what happens is that we have differentially private labels that are being predicted, where each label that the ensemble predicts with the noisy argmax has a bounded privacy leakage. The problem is that this leakage was going to accumulate over time. And so the more queries that the ensemble responds to, the more uh, privacy we might possibly leak. And so the, the less strong the guarantees we can prove are. And so to fix that, we use another step where we're going to use the ensemble uh, to train a student model. And so the student model is going to have access to a pool of unlabeled data. We're going to send this unlabeled data to the teachers. They're going to label the data with privacy. And then we can transfer their knowledge into the student model. What this means is once the student is deployed, the training is done, so there won't be any additional queries made to the teachers, so the privacy cost is fixed and we can answer as many queries as we want using the student. We can even discard everything that's left to the dotted line here uh, and that provides additional sort of, uh, sort of guarantees. There is one question in the chat uh, asking uh, whether 
we how do we divide the data? So in in this case, we just divide the data randomly, just uniformly. And so the nice thing about pate that we realized uh, earlier last year is that it makes it very suitable for a distributed deployment. Uh, and in particular, you can see here that I've described this whole setup as one ensemble of models trained by a, a, a central party. But you can actually take this setup and imagine that now each of these teacher models are trained by different parties. So for instance, you could have multiple hospitals and each of these hospitals locally have a little bit of data and they've trained a machine learning model from, from this data, right? And so the question is now, can these hospitals collaborate and together use Pate to make predictions that are more accurate, for instance, than if uh, they used their individual model uh, individually? And so the answer is yes. We actually uh, are also going to present so the, this result here at ICLR uh, coming up this year, where what we're doing is we're injecting cryptographic primitives into the idea behind Pate in order to be able to propose a protocol that uh, implements Pate in a completely distributed way. And so the idea is that the, the teachers here are going to play the role of the student to the right, but they're going to play the role uh, of the student in, in alternative rounds, right? So one of the teachers is going to become what we call the querying parties, and all of the other teachers are the answering parties. And so what happens is the querying party wants to send an input to the answering parties and use uh, Pate to obtain the noisy argmax of their prediction on this input. So what we are doing here first is we're asking the querying party to send their input, but we're going to send the input in an encrypted way so that the answering parties are not able to read the input directly. Then we can use homomorphic machine learning to predict on this encrypted input. And so each answering party is going to uh, produce a logit vector, which indicates their prediction for the different classes for this specific input. And then what happens is that we're going to have the querying party engage with each answering party in a two-party protocol to turn these logit vectors into one hot vector, which means that we essentially turn the uh, answering parties prediction into a vote. And then the answering parties are going to send their shares to a central uh, trusted party, which we call the content service provider. And the content service provider is going to take each of these shares and by uh, again, engaging in a two party protocol of the querying party is going to be able to reconstruct the histogram uh, from each of the answering parties votes, add noise to that histogram and then again, engage in one last exchange with the querying party to reveal to the querying party the noisy argmax of the prediction. And so this is very cool because now what this means is that the querying party has not revealed their input to the answering parties, yet has received a prediction on that input. The, the answering parties get nice guarantees too because they haven't revealed their model to the querying party and also they obtain differential privacy guarantees, of course, through the use of Pate. So what this means is that they also have guarantees that their own training data is not going to be leaked by the fact that they uh, gave a prediction to the querying party. And so this is a very uh, nice setup when you want to have this approach to machine learning, which is collaborative and distributed, where you can imagine that, for instance, one of the hospital will get a patient that they don't have the right training data for. And so they can query the other hospitals and be able to uh, predict on this patient despite not locally having the right data. Of course, they can use this label to improve their local model. Uh, and so the querying party can gradually improve their own local model based on this interaction. And so this is why we think this is a very uh, attractive alternative to other uh, distributed machine learning frameworks that have been proposed recently. Uh, in particular, this is, in, in our opinion, uh, better suited to federated, uh, than federated learning uh, in settings where the number of participants are, are small. And so to understand why, in federated learning, you have to uh, assume that there is a central party that is trusted by everyone, and this central party is going to aggregate the model updates 
uh, that everyone is producing. And so what this means is that all of the participants are uh, forced to use the same model. Whereas here we can have each participant use different models. Of course, federated learning does not protect privacy uh, because there's, there's no sort of randomness injected uh, by federated learning. The only guarantee you get in federated learning is confidentiality, where rather than share the data with the central party, you share model updates. So here, instead, we provide confidentiality and privacy uh, through differential privacy at the same time. So the, the privacy guarantee protection is, is, of course, a lot stronger. Um, and so one of the nice things that we found in, in our evaluation is that this can also help us improve the fairness of our local model predictions, uh, again, because we're able to have access to uh, distributions from the different participants. Um, okay, so this is what I wanted to, to discuss around PATE, and so this, this extension of it, which is called CAPSI. So now I want to uh, come back to the notion of differential privacy and uh, explain why I think it's a, such a strong um, improvement uh, for, for privacy preserving machine learning. And in particular, why approaches, uh, for instance, like federal learning that do not provide uh, differential privacy are not going to provide us with, with interesting guarantees in, in the long run. Um, and so here, this is where I'm going to contrast with uh, the work that we've done on adversarial examples to demonstrate sort of what I'm uh, trying to say. Uh, and in particular, when we look at defenses against adversarial examples, we've identified a large class of defenses which are doing what we call gradient masking. And the intuition behind these defenses is to say, well, adversarial examples are produced by gradient-based search over the, the model. So if you produce a model like this one, which has flat, uh, uninformative, uh, loss surfaces, then the gradients that, that you're computing over this model are not going to uh, lead you to find adversarial examples. So there's been lots of different techniques that have been proposed that eventually uh, sum up into doing something along these lines. The problem with this is that as an adversary, you can attack the model in a black box fashion. And so in that case, you're going to compute the gradients over a model whose gradients are very informative. And so you can still find the adversarial examples because the gradient masking hasn't uh, made the model a better uh, prediction model. It just has made it harder to find the adversarial examples. And so now, if I move to the privacy question on the right, there is a similar example that we can think of uh, and that we've demonstrated in, in a recent paper uh, with my student, Christopher, where the, the idea is to look at membership inference. So if you look at membership inference, a lot of the attacks rely on the confidence of the model in order to tell whether a point was used in the training set or not. And so, of course, a lot of people have looked at defenses against membership inference that simply prevent the model from releasing the confidence score in one way or the other. And so this provides an illusion of robustness to membership inference because if the attack doesn't have access to the confidence and it needs the confidence, of course, it's not gonna, it's not gonna succeed. But what Christopher demonstrated is that he could come up with a label only attack that does not need access to the confidence, but still performs on par or better than the confidence based attacks. So this is what you can see here. Uh, the confidence based attack is the blue line and the attack success of his label only attack is the uh, dotted orange line. And so the way that this uh, attack works, if you're curious, is that uh, you, you submit the input that you care about, and then you, you perturb it until you see the label change in the model's prediction. And the number of perturbations that you have to introduce before you see this change gives you a proxy for the confidence. And so the interesting thing that uh, Chris la later found is that differential privacy is the only defense strategy that actually provides robustness uh, to, to his attack. Whereas other forms of defenses that are essentially doing confidence masking, uh, like uh, data augmentation uh, or uh, just masking different confidence scores or re regularization, do not provide uh, nearly as much robustness to, to membership inference than differential privacy. And so I think this is a really good example where the worst case definition that differential privacy is bringing uh, is really driving home the, the point 
uh, that it provides robustness to the adversaries, even adversaries that we haven't even invented yet. And so this is a much uh, nicer guarantee uh, than what we've uh, obtained, for instance, when defending against uh, adversarial examples. So one, one thing that I do want to, to uh, mention is that there are limitations of differential privacy. And in particular, these limitations are uh, very apparent uh, when working on healthcare. So one of my students, Vinith, worked on uh, differential privacy for machine learning in healthcare and found that the utility impact that we observe when training models with differential privacy in healthcare is significantly more important than for models trained on, for instance, common image benchmarks. And so this is, of course, unfortunate uh, and can be understood by the fact that when you're learning with differential privacy, you don't want to learn things that are from the tail of the distribution that you don't have that many examples of and that are sort of outliers to the main mode of your distribution. And the problem is that in healthcare, these are the points that you actually get a lot of utility from because these are the interesting cases, the interesting patients that you learn uh, a lot from. And so this is an unfortunate tension and it's made even worse by the fact that uh, Vinith tried to uh, sort of understand what is the underlying reason. Um, and, and in some cases, what he was able to show is that the fact that you learn with differential privacy, with strong privacy guarantees, means that uh, whereas the initial model was uh, basically making good predictions based on some points from a minority subpopulation in the data set, the model that is trained with strong privacy is doing its job and is not able to learn from these minorities. But as a consequence, the majority uh, subpopulation is not overly influent in, uh, in the predictions that the model is making, which in addition to uh, leading to poor uh, prediction accuracy, it also increases the lack of fairness of the prediction. So this is uh, in some sort uh, doubly uh, concerning. And so now we're, we've been sort of looking at the interactions between privacy and fairness uh, as the result of, of this result. And so this, this will appear at, at FACT uh, uh, later this year. So I think the conclusion from this first part of the talk uh, is, is really that we need to find definitions like differential privacy that allow us to align machine learning at training time with human norms, right? And so an open problem is to define definitions like differential privacy for guarantees or human norms that we're not able to model yet. For instance, security is one where we see that in uh, research on adversarial examples, we still don't have any way to define what we mean by robustness. And of course, as I just explained, there is a yet another open problem, which is how do we provide multiple human norms such as privacy and fairness simultaneously? So this is really not clear. So I see a couple of questions popping up. I'm going to power through because I realize I only have 10 minutes left. So I'm going to try and, and get to the last part of my presentation. Um, so the, the last part is really looking at test time uh, deployments of machine learning and looking at how we can mitigate some of the failures that we're inevitably going to observe uh, because we're not going to be able to perfectly align the machine learning system with our human norms. And so the first uh, mechanism that I want to discuss very briefly is admission control. So most machine learning models today are deployed with the assumption that they should reveal their prediction for all possible inputs, which is obviously flawed. And so there's this interesting question of how do we decide to abstain from making a prediction? The problem is that it's very hard to estimate uncertainty of a prediction in a calibrated way. And so what we did in this approach called the deep K nearest neighbors is that we looked at the internal representations of a deep neural network and used that to infer how much support there is in a prediction from the training data. And so what we do is we take each of these representations here where you can see all of the images being the training points. And we take our test image, we pass it through the model. And for each of these representations, we look for the training images that have the closest representation to our representation that we're inferring at test time. And so this is done for each representation for each layer in the deep neural network. 
And so because these are training images, you have the label of these training images. And so you can look at the homogeneity of these labels across the entire architecture. And what we found is that when there is homogeneity, it means that the model has a lot of support in the training set for making this particular prediction. And whereas when it's predicting on outliers or things like adversarial examples, it will essentially reject the prediction uh, simply by observing the fact that the labels of the training data are heterogeneous. And so this raises an interesting question, uh, which we explore in this paper, the soft nearest neighbor loss, which is how do you produce deep neural networks which have representations that are more amenable to, these, uh, uh, to this analysis? And this is interesting in general to think about rather than thinking about security and privacy and trustworthy machine learning as a whole sort of machine learning model where you're reasoning input to output on a certain property, how do we build sort of these properties at the level of each layer in a deep neural network, which intuitively makes sense that you can uh, provide stronger statements if you reason block by block rather than taking the whole architecture as, as a single unit. The last uh, sort of, um, problem that I wanted to discuss, or I guess the second to last, is model governance. And here, the idea is a little different where we've deployed our model and we now want to uh, sort of manage its life cycle. In particular, multiple things could arise, uh, such as the fact that we identify someone has poisoned our training set, as I explained with the Tay chatbot example in the first slide, or due to uh, sort of uh, changes in uh, a user's perception of privacy, they might revoke access to their data that we used in the past. And so here we have to wonder how are we going to deal with the fact that we've trained machine learning models on these data sets and that we now have to unlearn what we've learned from these specific points. And of course, this is something that is promoted in recent developments in European and uh, Canadian, for instance, legislation uh, on the right to be forgotten. And so here, it's important to note that, again, differential privacy is not the solution because differential privacy will bound how much any point in the training set has an influence on our, uh, on our machine learning model. Whereas here, we want to uh, not bound, but make zero the influence of one specific training point on, on the model. So this is something different. And if we wanted to use differential privacy, we would basically have to prove that epsilon is zero. So we wouldn't be able to learn anything in the first place. And so here, the machine learning unlearning is even made more difficult in, uh, in deep learning, for instance, because the algorithms are stochastic due to the mini batch sampling, due to the non-convex nature of the optimization, and also the fact that the procedure is typically incremental. And so what we've decided to prove when working on machine unlearning is a very strict definition uh, that allows us to come back to the user uh, with confidence saying that we've unlearned their, their data. And the idea is to say, if we have uh, a model, what we're going to prove to the user is the distribution of models that we obtain by first learning on data that includes their data and then on learning their data the distribution of models that we achieve through this process is going to be identical to the distribution of models that we would have obtained if we had never learned on their data in the first place. Okay, and so this is a very strong guarantee to the user basically that despite the fact that we've in the past learned from their data and now we've unlearned from th this data, the fact that they contributed their data does not influence in any ways the distribution of models that we're now seeing after the unlearning process. And so in, uh, in, in the paper that we're, we're presenting later at Oakland this year, uh, we present an approach for, for doing that that improves over the naive baseline, which is to simply retrain the model. And so what we've done is basically introduced two knobs that uh, alter the way that we're going to train our machine learning models. And this is agnostic to the machine learning model that you're training, assuming you're, you're using a variant of gradient descent. So the two knobs are sharding and slicing, which explains the name CISA. Um, so sharding is similar to the idea behind Pate, where rather than train a large model, you're going to train an ensemble of smaller models on disjoint sets of, of the data. These, these disjoint sets are called shards. And so what this means is that if you have to unlearn a point, you only need to 
uh, retrain the model that corresponds to the specific shard where that data point was contained, which will take less time because this model was trained on less data and uh, could have less parameters. The other nub is slicing, where within each of these shards, we're going to change the way that we present data points during training. So typically, if you do stochastic gradient descent, you take a pass through the entire data set in each epoch of training. Instead, what we're going to do here is we're going to gradually introduce data throughout training. So we're going to slice our shard into multiple slices, and we're going to start by training on one first slice. So for instance, 10% of the data. And once we've uh, trained a little bit on this 10% of the data, we're going to save a model parameter state. And so this can be done using checkpointing uh, mechanisms already in place in most uh, frameworks. And we're going to then introduce the second slice of data, save another state of the model parameters, introduce the third slice and so on until we've seen the entire data set. What this means is when we unlearn, we can identify the last model parameter state known before introducing the slice that contained this data point. And then we can resume training from there, which again, combining the sharding and the slicing, we're able to decrease the training time that is required to unlearn a specific point. And then we were able to prove this very strict definition of unlearning, uh, which is, which is uh, very interesting. In particular, this raises the question of how do we want to shard and slice the data? We did it uh, uniformly, but you could imagine using knowledge of your uh, uh, expected unlearning requests to rearrange the data in a way that will speed up this process even more. Of course, uh, this raises ethical questions uh, because it might impact the, the fairness of the predictions. And so the last problem that I wanted to talk about was deepfakes, but obviously I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to skip this part. But what I wanted to say here is that detecting deepfakes is not going to be a valuable solution to the deepfakes problem, uh, and that we need to, to explore solutions that uh, merge a scientific approach with a policy approach. Uh, and the reason is that if you think about the way that deepfakes are produced, they're produced using uh, generative adversarial networks very often, which are themselves uh, trained using a game between a generator and a discriminator, which is essentially a detector. And so the better we make the detectors, the better the generators will become. And so this is sort of a never ending arms race, uh, which we describe in this, in this uh, article uh, on, the, on the Turing test. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, to conclude now. So I have a few minutes for questions, uh, but I think the, the takeaway from this talk is really that uh, trustworthy machining is an opportunity to make machine learning better, right? I want to be very optimistic uh, and this is uh, sort of what I wanted to say here is that at training time, we need to find definitions like differential privacy that align machine learning with human norms. And we saw how differential privacy is a worst case sort of alternative to the average case generalization guarantees that machine learning is trying to prove. And so when we have a differentially private model, it will generalize better. So this is a very nice synergy that we should seek to achieve with different human norms like security or fairness uh, and so on. And then at test time, I think we haven't done enough research on how to achieve model governance, uh, which is uh, things including uh, admission control or machine unlearning are examples of how you manage a model once it has been deployed to uh, sort of, if you can think of it like this, patch the, the, the vulnerabilities as you identify them uh, while the model is, is being deployed. And of course, as I just mentioned, sometimes we won't be able to solve everything through technology. So we have to think about legal frameworks. Uh, with, with that, uh, I will uh, take any questions that are left. And I just wanted to, uh, to thank my students for all their contributions by putting their, their pictures up here uh, while I take questions. Thank hey, you. Thank you so I see there are a couple okay. of 